You're gonna be a football player when you do the ball. Today is the best day of your life. Believe it. He might be the finest quarterback in Purdue in the last 10 years. He needs to be like that. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. Rest of your life. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. I was 31 in 1978, my second season as owner of the 49ers. That's when Freddie came to us. People scratched their heads about our friendship. They just couldn't figure it out. Freddie loved me when I was on top, and he even loved me more when I wasn't. May God rest your soul, Freddie. We will miss you terribly, and we love you dearly. When Freddie got diagnosed with colon cancer, he was already in stage four. I am so grateful that Freddie had Eddie throughout this whole ordeal. Yeah. I'm telling you, he has, he's just been there. He's been there through it all. Eddie was a very, very, very strong force in my husband's life. We just became so close. The friendship just grew and grew and grew. We truly were like brothers. We loved each other, and I miss them dearly. You know, during my ownership years, I felt as though these kids were just part of my family. <laughs> Edward J. DeBartolo Jr. owned the San Francisco 49ers for 23 years. In that span, his teams won five Super Bowls. Everybody in this room gave that commitment. And he won the undying loyalty of those who played for him. I'd walk through fire for Eddie. Uh, most of the guys I played with would walk through fire for Eddie. Eddie gave all of his guys something that you couldn't buy. I think we're all proud to be one of his guys. There wasn't anybody in the NFL that didn't want to be one of his guys. I'll be one of his guys for the rest of my life. If he calls on me, I'm the first to jump. He taught me things in my life that my dad never taught me. He not only made me a better player, but he made me a better man. It's about as good a feeling as you can get to know that I had some small part in Mr. D's journey. That journey began not by the bay, but near Youngstown, Ohio. I'm gonna go into the new house. Well, it's almost finished. Huh? You wanna pick a flower? On March 31st, 1977, ownership of the 49ers passed into the hands of Edward J. DiBartolo, Jr. Though just completing construction of a new home outside Youngstown, Ohio, the DiBartolo family will spend much of their time together in San Francisco. You're gonna like San Francisco, do you think? Yeah. Yeah? When are you gonna come out there with me? Pretty soon? Yeah. And Mommy likes San Francisco. I think Mommy'd move tomorrow. <laughs> and you, do you like San Francisco? Do you wanna to go to San Francisco? I don't know much no. what you're talking no. about. No. Yeah. At the age of 30, DeBartolo was the NFL's youngest owner when he headed west to meet a team and a town he knew little about. I had been to San Francisco one time in my life on a vacation uh, with my parents when I was very young. His inexperience showed when he met the Bay Area press for the first time. During this press conference, I got up and said uh, NFL football was a business and that we intended to treat it like a business. They took that and blew it out of proportion that these interlopers from the East are out here trying to destroy our great San Francisco 49ers. Eddie was a stranger. Uh, he was somebody from Ohio who bought a San Francisco team who came out, but he went home every week. At that time, football wasn't a 12-month-a-year business. Absentee ownership, I don't believe in that, and uh, I am going to be a very active owner. The 49ers were very much a homegrown team, owned by the Morabito family. 
I was there before they bought the team in 77 from the Morabitos, and it was just a little family company and business that, oh, by the way, happened to play pro football. I'm not going to make a lot of predictions. Uh, the coach DeBartolo inherited, to to Monty uh, Clark, uh, was forced out one week after the ownership change. A move less than popular with 49er players. A coach like Monty, who is really an outstanding coach, you hate to see him leave. First game of 1977, we play the Pittsburgh Steelers on Monday Night Football in Pittsburgh. It was Christians and Lions. It really was. It was not a pretty sight. I could never forget it. Jim Plunkett was our starting quarterback. It was just a horrible experience playing a team like Pittsburgh. Mr. D did a lot of business in Pittsburgh. They lived in Youngstown. That's really not that far. I'm not sure if that first game was quite the NFL they had thought they bought into. He and his father were in the locker room after the game. It didn't take a body language expert to figure out when they weren't happy. You know, Eddie was like every other owner that comes into the league. Very, very successful. And, you know, you find out pretty quick that what you did in that business doesn't necessarily translate into success in another one. You have to remember that none of the family, me or anybody else, had any knowledge of how to run a professional football team. To remedy that problem, DeBartolo hired an expert. Joe Thomas is going to run the entire football operation. Well, it was just the worst possible decision, and it was the worst possible result. With Joe Thomas as general manager, the 49ers win 7-25 and 25 over two seasons and burn through three head coaches. Our first couple of coaches, they, they just didn't do the job. He also made a, a yes, horrible man. trade that I, at the time, agreed to. Put the call through, please. I think he did that absolutely for PR purposes. Oh, Jay Simpson, how are you? OJ turned out to be a, you know, a flop. His knee was bad. We gave up a lot of draft picks. So that was one of the worst trades probably that any team had ever made. So a, a change had to be made. Last week, the 49ers added yet another dismal chapter to their woeful 1978 story. It was as a result of that disaster that Eddie really felt he had to grab hold of the situation and he had to run it and get out from under the shadow of the DeBartolo Corporation. The DeBartolo Corporation outside Youngstown, Ohio was a construction and real estate development company founded by Eddie DeBartolo's father. The story of Mr. DeBartolo Sr. is really the perfect American success story. He began building the family fortune right after World War II. The young developer had an idea to build houses for the GIs returning home, and they'd need a place to shop, but not necessarily downtown. He built the first of his strip malls along Route 224 in Boardman in 1950. When those strip centers started working, he came up with this concept that why not and close it, and people can come there, shop in comfort, and that became the shopping mall. The Bidelo is widely credited with the idea of mall shopping. At the very least, he's considered the country's top shopping center developer. Success in business allowed the company to acquire sports properties that eventually included several racetracks. The NHL's Pittsburgh Penguins and the NFL's 49ers. Helping govern the burgeoning empire were DeBartolo's daughter Denise and her older brother, Edward Jr. Camera roll six. Sports was always a very big part of our family. Probably owning a football team is the uh, dream of every red-blooded American. But DeBartolo's boyish enthusiasm seemed more like youthful naivete in 1979 when he changed coaches for the fifth time in two years. For us. Southern Cal is an awesome team, as you know. And I had watched this coach at Stanford, Bill Walsh. I met him out at a hotel in San Francisco. I knew in less than 10 minutes that he was the man that I wanted to run the franchise. Eddie saw something in Bill Walsh no one else in the NFL saw. I mean, a lot of people indicated that Bill was smart, but they didn't think he actually was head coach material. I remember the emphasis back then was how old he was. You know, gee, it's awful old to be getting your first head coaching job. It was a huge hire by Eddie to take the chance on Bill. 
At the age of 47, Bill Walsh was 15 years older than his new owner. You know, I liked him. It was a great marriage. And even though we had two seasons that weren't great, it was something that you could see was on the right track. Eddie bought the team in 1977. I became mayor in November of 78 under very difficult circumstances with the assassinations of my predecessor, George Moscone, and Harvey Milk. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. There was hatred like I have never seen. San Francisco had some very, very dark days. They only assassinate good people. Bad people, nothing happens to them. Nixon, nobody will shoot him. Into this very disparate situation came the Niners and began to win. Montana throwing to Solomon. He got it. Touchdown, San Francisco. People took great pride in something going right. Being a 49er has now become something that can be pointed to with pride. In 1981, the 49ers stunned the football world by going 13-3 and and hosting the Cowboys in the NFC Championship game. I was there. I was in the stands way on the other side of the field. They marked the ball down at the San Francisco 11. There wasn't much time left, so I figured, you know, there was a good chance we'd lose the game. I wanted to get down on the field to, to greet the players. They came down the elevator, and I was there with them. We're in the end zone down there, along with the policeman on horseback. We're trying to watch the game and prevent ourselves from getting stepped on by a horse. So I was in front of our dugout, and I was standing behind a really big horse. And the cop was on the horse, and he was kind of telling me what was going on. He rolls right, looking to throw, and he throws into the end zone. Touchdown! 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 All of a sudden, I heard, you know, all kinds of screams. All I saw was this big horse's butt, and the cop told me we scored. That's how I knew that Dwight had made the catch. Well, he saw it probably when I saw it on TV, because <laughs> I didn't see it either. <laughs> Looking to throw, and he throws into the end zone. Touchdown! Touchdown! I'm so proud, and I don't think anything could top this. Anything in my life. And I love you all, and I thank you. And you guys earned it and deserve it, because you're the best team in football. Actually, it was sort of a surreal feeling. I remember being with Bill. I remember Ronnie Lott yelling Super Bowl. Oh, I don't think it was expected by anybody. Is this the, the greatest thing in your own empire? No that question you... about it. Greatest personal thing that's ever happened to me. That we're going to go to Detroit and beat Cincinnati. In Super Bowl 16, the 49ers took home the first championship in team history. I don't know, it, it happens so quick. That's why you have to really live the moment. You're so worried about the game that you forget about enjoying what it's all about. And that may have happened in the first Super Bowl because I was in a state of shock. The 49ers hadn't won much of anything in their 36-year history, but now, said a fan, San Francisco is number one in two things, being weird and football. And I could truly say that the first Super Bowl victory united a fractured city. It's a sense of fulfillment in the wake of the assassinations of George Moscone and Harvey Milk, the Niners helped a broken city heal. It was a healing time for San Francisco, and it really brought everything together with the football and the artistic community, which historically weren't always on the, on the same page. And then I'll never forget, we had a parade. I was in a front car along with Eddie and Bill Walsh. We looked out and every street was jammed. Over a million people were there. I'd like to thank you all for being so patient for us the last 10 years and taking all the trash that you had to put up with. But you don't have to put up with it anymore because Bill Walsh and Eddie DiBartolo have made us the world champion. You know, the 49ers had had a sort of a hapless career up until then. And although we'd come close, we'd never really 
grab the brass ring. How long have you been waiting for them to be champions? 1,500 years. Because of Eddie D and because of Bill Walsh, it was really, really a thrilling time. Any of my guys here? Jerry, Jerry. I mean, come on, Jerry. Freddie was just yeah. Freddie. Yeah. And he did everything that he could for everybody. And How could you not love him? We traded for Freddie in 1978. Then in 79, Joe came and Dwight, and we became sort of like a foursome. When I used to come to San Francisco for games on Friday night, they would pick me up at the airport and we'd go out and you know, have a beer together. He's only 10 years older than me, so we became friends. It was almost like he was an older brother that you got to hang out with, you know, except, you know, he had a private plane. By 1984, the 49ers were once again super. You're going into another Super Bowl, Ed. Let's talk about Miami for just a moment. They scare you? Oh, sure. They're dynamite. They're, they're probably the, uh, the second best team in football. <laughs> <laughs> in 1984, I mean, Danny Marino and his receivers, Duper and Clayton, they were setting the world on fire. Get it in, go! Montana drops back, short drop, fakes once. He's got to run it himself. He's into the end zone. That was one of the really great, great football teams, I think, of all time. And Craig goes in for the score! Congratulations, Bob. You got one for, you got one for the other hand! The 49ers' second championship was a hit back into Bartolo's hometown. Youngstown's always number one in everybody's hearts and everybody's eyes. If there's one thing I wish people knew more about, it was how important his way of doing business that he learned from his dad, that he learned from the years at DeBartolo Corp, applied to the Niners. Everybody that sits in this chair is going to say the same thing. It was all first class. It was always first class. First class. First class. It was always first class, and it was because of him. We go first class. We can guarantee you that. There's a club in the, in the league that does anything the right way any more than we do. I like to know who the hell it is. <coughs> say the Dallas Cowboys. Check their salaries. Quick, see what they pay compared to us. It's not even a comparison. And if you go right through the lake, why? Because we got a super owner, and because we got people that care. Eddie DeBartolo Jr., the most generous owner in the league. Astronomical salaries, wide body planes, separate hotel rooms for his players. His largesse is legendary. Couldn't be any better right here. First class. These guys felt like they were at home, the way they were treated. And I think it really helped. We had a string of away game victories that was unbelievable. During one three-year span, San Francisco won 18 consecutive road games. Still an NFL record. The 49ers win again! We had an incredible road record, but all of it was due to him. The way we travel is the way we play. We treat you nice here. <laughs> Mr. DiBartolo likes to have the best. It was going to be first class, and it was going to be family. That's what the 49ers were built on. When my father started his company, he always treated people like they were part of the family. Could have been somebody working in the kitchen, or it could have been his senior vice president. If anybody had a problem, they could come to him. I wanted to carry that on into the football operation. Now this has got to be uh, heaven for you. Well, I think it's heaven for all of us because we're a family. This is a family. We're all together. Eddie DeBartolo, my wife, she calls him Santa Claus, actually. Hello, boys and girls. Hello. He opened his arms and welcomed me and my wife to the DeBartolo family. This is it. This is the life, huh? That was the beginning of big things for us. Can you say thanks, Mr. D? Can you say thanks, Mr. D? Santa knows your father, Charles Haley. The thing I loved about Mr. D is that he was a man of his word. He taught me what a team was and what a family was and the sacrifice we make for one another. The thing that makes this organization unique is the fact that the players almost develop a fraternal sense of commitment to the, the organization, namely Mr. DeBartolo. I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie DeBartolo would stand there holding towels after a game. Yeah, it seems cheesy, it seems contrived, but it doesn't to the rank and file. He was sending a very clear message 
You're not a piece of meat. Yeah. I understand that you are out there sweating for me so that I can gain happiness and income, and I appreciate that. Great job. Take this towel from me. In that locker room, they loved him. He would greet us most of the time right inside the locker room door. It's not like he was looking for footage of it on the news or anything. D, how you like that, huh? How you like that? Pretty good, huh? And it wasn't a fake or a phony thing. That was kind of his way of doing business. Boss, you want to play golf with me this week? <laughs> My dad knew every player's name. He knew their wives' names. He knew their kids' names. And it wasn't because he wanted to look good. You want to dance for him? Come on. Come on. He really wanted them to feel loved and appreciated, and I think they did. You know, he allowed us to have fun. He had fun with us. <laughs> you felt his compassion when it came to real-life, personal uh, situations that you were going through. He hurt when we hurt. When I tore my knee up, in the locker room, the first non-trainer doctor guy is Eddie DeBartolo. Teared up, he was sincere with how he felt. One player in particular felt DeBartolo's kindness. Jeff Fuller got hurt. He was making a tackle on the sideline, and he tore all his nerves and ligaments and lost the use of his arm for the rest of his life. I think that he probably beat me to the Stanford Hospital. He was there. Every day I was there. He did some things for me that owners don't do and, and haven't done. He made sure that I was okay and my family was okay. Though under no obligation, DeBartolo set up an annuity to care for Jeff Fuller for the rest of his life. I just felt as though he deserved it. Anytime any of our players got hurt, a little piece of me was hurt with him. He was going to be there for you, and he expected you to be there for him. And if you didn't, you know, there were repercussions. Say it's my birthday. I'm one. Obviously, I've um, one. simmered down some as I've grown older. Keep up with big spanking on the butt. Big one. Big one. Ow! Run, run, he's going to get you. Ah. You know, back in the 80s and some of the 90s, yes, I, I, I had a temper. Um, I got mad at things. Ooh, did he have a temper? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure you've heard stories, so I'm not going to mention them. But there were some crazy ones. There was a small TV that we were watching, and I picked it up and I threw it. Eddie picked one of these stools up, and he flung it. To this day, he won't admit that he threw a couple of full Coke cans at me, but um, he did. Fortunately, he missed. A glass Coke machine, I think, got in the way of his leg. <laughs> The machine shattered, the glass went all over the place. Oh, and everybody was scared to death that I'd cut my leg. Actually, I never, not one drop of blood. He was raised in a family of wealth, but Eddie was a pretty tough guy. Eddie ran with the construction guys and the leasing guys. He didn't run with the lawyers, the financial people. As everybody knows that anybody from Youngstown uh, just goes out and wins. He's a tough Youngstown, Ohio guy, and uh, he'll brawl in a second. According to police, several witnesses reported seeing DeBartolo in a fight with two Packers fans. I, I had a very short fuse, and I, I admit that. But that's what we loved about him. He was feisty, and he wanted to win as much as we did. The main thing is, I don't like to lose. That's it. He was just so competitive. The person that comes in second is, is a loser. Show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. What made people love him was he was so human. He had a temper. He wasn't perfect. He didn't pretend to be. He might fly off the handle and yell at you. He might cut you, but you never felt like he was BSing you. Part of what made Eddie so great was this passion and this fire. But at times, just like nuclear energy, if it's not properly controlled and channeled, it can have a real devastating effect. He, he never came in a locker room blasting players. He would blast Bill. Okay, Bill took the brunt of it for us. We lost in New Orleans one time, and we should have won. It was just a tough loss, and 
he just kind of lost it. <laughs> Mr. D and him, they clash like they clash like two big rams, boy. So I couldn't believe it. He was like, wow. And you can hear him and Eddie just going at it. He fired Bill that day in New Orleans. Bill was done. I think that I was ordered by Eddie to fire Bill Walsh approximately seven times, maybe eight. And there were times when Bill deserved it. You know, it wasn't just Eddie overreacting. And then I would call Bill, and Bill would be all upset. John McVeigh, our general manager, would play his role in San Francisco, and I'd play my role in Ohio. And then we got the two together, and then they love each other. It's, it's like being married. I mean, no marriage goes smooth. The low ebb in the Walsh to Bartolo relationship came after a playoff loss to the Vikings. It was 1987. We had a good team. We clearly were the best team in the National Football League. 13 wins, two losses. And that team was just flat. A magnificent catch by Carter. Unbelievable. Well, the playoff loss to the Vikings in 87 was part of the most traumatic experience I've had uh, in sports. Coming off the field, I just was so embarrassed, so humiliated. He was the type of guy that carried the burden on his shoulders. There isn't an easy way out. There isn't a way that you can avoid it. It's there and it'll live with us. I was really afraid at the time that he might be having a little bit of a burnout. I was exhausted emotionally. There was pressure on me to win from ownership. It had taken its toll over a period of 10 years. Heading into 1988, the NFL's perfect marriage appeared to be on the rocks. But Bill pulled the team together. You know, we ended up going to Miami, playing Cincinnati. The Bengals take a 16 to 13 lead. And, you know, came down to the pass. 39 seconds remaining. Back to throw Montana. Stepped up throws. And the 49ers have won the Super Bowl. After that game, I saw the men celebrating with Eddie DeBarlo and almost felt like an outsider in a matter of seconds. An outsider who just won the Super Bowl. God, I'm so happy. This is the sweetest victory I've ever had as an owner. Better than the first two. DeBartolo's third championship would be his last with Walsh. I didn't touch it until now. It's just it's wonderful. I knew we had love for each other. I knew we cared for each other, but I think it was time for me to leave. Was this the final game on the sideline for a great coach, Bill Walsh? Emotional moment right now with the coach down here. Bill was the greatest coach in my mind ever, but you can't separate Mr. D from that. I don't think without Eddie, Bill could have done it. Bill, he was a giant in the NFL, but it was Eddie behind the scenes that made a lot of those things even possible. Those guys working together as a team, I think that's why we won. Bill Walsh became head coach of the San Francisco 49ers 14 and a half years ago. From that point forward, my life would never ever be the same. Each man was an extension of the other, so it was a chain link. We were good friends and when Bill died, I think I was one of the last people to go out there and be with him. And I remember sitting in his hospital room at Stanford, and we talked about um, the relationship and how we loved each other. And um, he just, uh, he thanked me, and I thanked him. And uh, we embraced, and I left, and that was the last time I, I saw Bill alive. Bill Walsh died the way he lived, with sublime grace and with class. And I'll tell you this, Bill, I do pity anyone in heaven when you get your hands on a piece of chalk in a blackboard. <laughs> and may you rest in peace always. And I loved you very much. Ah, 59 laser! In 1989, the 49ers capped a decade of dominance with a rout of the Broncos in Super Bowl 24. The San Francisco 49ers become the first team to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls back -to -back back -to -back. since the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh 
but the team of the 80s soon faced tough decisions going into the 90s. Joe Montana has been traded to the Kansas City Chiefs pursuant to his request. Joe, with the press conference, it was one of the worst days of my life. I don't think I'll ever have a relationship with anybody, no matter how long I own this team, which is going to be a long time, that I have with Joe Montana. That's when somebody like me should never be in that sport. We made the transition from Joe Montana to Steve Young, and it was brutal on Eddie. Eddie didn't want Joe to leave the 49ers. Taking over for the owner's favorite player was Steve Young, who hadn't always gotten along with Joe Montana. You know, they had their differences, obviously. It's human nature. You know, you look over your shoulder. The fact that Eddie treated me fairly just speaks to the enormity of who Eddie is. I mean, it's like he's got his Italian, you know, Notre Dame guy, Joe Montana, and he's willing to give me a chance. Maybe more than anything, that tells you a little bit about Eddie. In 1994, Young led the 49ers to a 13-3 record with a new cast of 49ers. Dion, he's high stepping. But that December, the team suffered a devastating loss off the field. The father of the modern shopping mall died at the height of the Christmas shopping season. There was a lot of emotion about that. We knew that Senior had done the spade work, that the family could be where they were. We as a team, we took this family thing pretty seriously. We felt invited in. We felt the glory of being able to be a 49er at that time. And so we owed it to Senior to play great football. And the 49ers are going to the Super Bowl. We are going to go to Miami, and we will bring back another championship. That was the deal, right? We'll make your life wonderful. you got to go be super. That's the deal. We wanted to fulfill our end of the bargain. Young goes deep middle. He's got Jerry Wright. Is now number one all time with six touchdown passes. When you win a Super Bowl, it all comes rushing back how much someone's done for you. His belief, faith in me, I was just so grateful that he was willing to battle for me to be out there and to do this. It was a very, very emotional day for everybody. You know, watching my uncle and my mom up on the stage, getting the trophy together and sharing that moment, taking that over from my grandfather. To my sister Denise, this is a very, very important victory. This one is for dad. You know, sort of passing on the torch officially to the next generation. There's just a lot of things that happened that were really special about that day. The 49ers fifth Super Bowl was a bright spot during otherwise tough times at the DeBartolo Corporation. The value of DeBartolo's real estate holdings began to erode in recent years and he was forced to sell the Penguins and other holdings to raise cash. Eddie was involved with some advisors that were trying to find expeditious ways to alleviate some of the financial strain that he was undergoing. One of those routes that some people were advising involved gaming. In 1997, DeBartolo's name surfaced in a federal indictment. Federal investigators are looking into DeBartolo's business relationship with Edwin Edwards, the former Louisiana governor. Did you give Mr. Edwards any money, sir? No comment. I'll speak to my lawyer, please. He screwed up and got involved in something in Louisiana that he shouldn't have, and, and he knew it. Eddie DeBartolo says he met with former Governor Edwin Edwards in this diner and gave him a $400,000 payoff in cash to help get a gambling permit in Louisiana. Why do it? It actually was just plain stupidity, and I should have just walked away from it. DeBartolo says the former governor demanded the 400000 saying, without it, quote, there's going to be a serious problem with your license. I was as much to blame because I was old enough to know better and too stupid to do anything about it. In 1998, DeBartolo pled guilty to the charge of failure to report an extortion attempt by a public official. What was it like for you today to stand in a federal court and plead guilty to a felony? It was, um, it was like visiting a, a little piece of hell. Right? Right. Because it was just, it was not in character, it was not uh, something that I ever thought or wanted to do. Eddie pled guilty to a criminal charge and it was pretty clear that that had to be addressed uh, under the uh, rules of the league relating to the integrity of the conduct of people in the league. So I felt that a suspension uh, from football participation was important.
DeBartolo was suspended by the NFL for one year in 1999. During that time, he and his sister suffered a falling out. The fact that now the family was embarrassed and he allowed himself to be duped by a very slick politician, she was angry. I'm not happy that Louisiana may have caused this uh, schism or this break, but it did. There's nothing I can do about it now. It's over. In 2001, Eddie and Denise de Bartolo reached a settlement to separate their financial interests. When I did this deal with my sister, I had the opportunity of taking the team or taking the other side of the business. I talked about it with my family, and I just thought it was best at that time to not be associated with football anymore. Oddly enough, Denise, who didn't really care as much about the team and the limelight, ended up getting the team, and Eddie, who didn't really care as much about the business, got the rest of the family business and did very, very well. Today, DeBartolo is one of Forbes magazine's 400 richest Americans. But the game of pro football is no longer part of his life. I think it's hurt more than anything that's ever happened to him in his life, other than losing his parents. That was his pride and joy. So I'm sure it, it hurt deeply. It's got to bother him. If he didn't miss it, you'd kind of think, what's wrong? But he does. I mean, we've talked about it. I think that my dad probably thinks about it every day of his life and wishes that he could just make it go away. Everything he had achieved and what he had built, he was going to see a lot of that go away from a perception standpoint publicly. So that to me was one of the saddest things I've seen. I've done some good things in my life, and I've made some mistakes in my life, and that was certainly one of them. Obviously, if I could live my life over again, it would never have happened, but we can't do that, so you go on with your life. Currently, Eddie DeBartolo makes his home in Tampa, Florida. As far as me and my family, we're doing well. I get an opportunity now to spend time with my daughters, my three grandsons, the baseball and the football games, which is absolutely wearing me out. Tonight, 7 o'clock, baseball. Tomorrow, 2 p.m., flag football. Sunday, another football game. It's crazy. That's the circle of life. Cake <laughs> You like cake? I love it, so my life is complete. Still, there are those who wonder if Eddie D would ever return to the game at which he was so successful. I know for a fact that there are a lot of owners in the NFL that would heartily vote to approve him as an owner. I can't speak for other owners. I can speak for this one, and I would. I know him to be a very talented decision maker, and that's the kind of people I want to have in the future of the NFL. I've told him numerous times, we need you back. He's someone that uh, football misses. We'd love to have him back in the NFL. You know what? It, there, there's been talk for 10 years. There's been opportunities. You know, I've looked at it, and I just can't see myself doing it. I'm just, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really, really satisfied with my life the way it is. In retirement, DeBartolo still attends the occasional football party. Now run it again for Tim Tebow. Did hey, you meet Tebow? 4,005. Yeah, I was outside with him. Hi, Matt. And still knows how to throw one. Welcome to the reunion. The coming together. In 2006, he hosted a four-day reunion for all five of his Super Bowl teams in Las Vegas. I'm feeling like Mr. Lucky today. Oh, it was ridiculous. 700 people in Vegas. He didn't even own the team at the time. He just, he just loves those people. Nobody. Nobody but him. That was a hell of a party. I don't know how many owners could throw it and have people come. It's a tough business, and you never leave when you want. You're always out on your ear when you don't think you should be. There's a lot of resentment that gets built up over time in football. Eddie's one of those guys. It's like, yeah, I, I got thrown out of my ear, but it was awesome, <laughs> you know? We wanted everybody that was involved in the five Super Bowls because we are family. It's memories that are good 
and it's memories that are not so good, but it doesn't matter. We all did this together. It's the relationships that continue after football is gone. I talk to eight or ten of these guys every week. Perhaps more important than the many relationships DeBartolo has maintained is the one he has mended. Denise, I talk to her a couple of times every week or two. Jed's doing a good job. I talk to him a lot. As long as he listens to himself and nobody else, he'll do fine. In 2009, DeBartolo was invited by his sister and nephew to be the inaugural enshrinee in the new 49ers Hall of Fame. Just to have him be a part of it is just such an important thing for me and my family. Knowing that my mom and my uncle were able to get through that and like family members do, be able to come back full circle. I want to thank my sister and her family, especially Jed York, for this great honor. He's always welcome with the 49ers. You are my 49er family. And I think that's what's more important to me is that you can bring everything back together. We have a, a big legacy to live up to. More recently, DeBartolo was a first-time finalist for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He belongs in the Hall of Fame, right next to the other owners that have five Super Bowl trophies, which would be none. I mean, obviously, the championships are there, and Eddie DeBartolo gets all the credit for giving Bill Walsh the opportunity, inspiring his players and writing the checks, the family atmosphere. Now, does that put him in the Hall of Fame? I don't know if that does it, but when you start adding all these things up together, it sure seemed pretty special. It was a magical time. I always felt that, especially the 80s, were so reflective of the spirit of Camelot. It definitely was Camelot. Eddie was a benevolent king, and Bill was the number one knight on horseback. And you had all the personalities the wonderful commitment to the cause. The lovely ladies, the maidens circling around as well, and it just could not have been better. And yet, there were times when the hurt. There will be no three-peat. The destruction was very devastating. We've been through some tough times, damn it. This is fantastic. This is the, honest to God, this is a storybook. I mean, it was magical, and Eddie DeBartolo is the guy that made it so magical. Everybody that suited up in that uniform wanted to lay it on the line for the DeBartolo name. They wanted to prove that that name was the best. We're the best. We are the best. He was by far the person who really allowed us to be incredible champions. All of the success that we had, none of this happens without him. It all started from the top and a great ownership. You know, there's several things you play for. You don't want to let your teammates down, you don't want to let Bill down, and you sure as hell don't want to let Eddie DeBartolo down. You're the world champ. You are! You are! You're the world champ! He was a great owner, not a good one. A great one. I mean, the greatest owner in professional sports history is DeBartolo. World to best owner! Right here. <laughs> we got him! What I was doing, I was doing from my heart. I just wanted to be part of it. And, and really, uh, it meant a lot to me.